For those of you who do not know me, I am Barbara Baldi and I have been leading for uh, quite some time the work of the OECD on digital government and government data, which is why, as I said, I really appreciate the opportunity that um, digital brings to us, especially at the current time when we've seen changing the way we um, are being productive, are living our lives, are working uh, radically. So all of a sudden, from, we were talking about being uh, moving towards an environment in which we were expected to be digital in being entirely digital. Um, so as we wait for the fourth speaker to um, be admitted to the, the conference, uh, I'd like first of all to say that it's a honor for me to be um, moderating and chairing this opening plenary uh, where we will be listening to four distinguished guests who will be sharing with us their insights and reflections on how data use can impact and shape government policies and we all know this is particularly important in the scenario in which uh, governments are dealing with the emergency um, related problems at the moment. We trust that this initial discussion will inspire conversations that will keep us busy over the next three days. And just as a kind reminder, you will all be able to ask questions. Please use the chat to ask the question um, and the speakers will address them at the end of the plenary. I will kindly invite you to be brief, clear and indicate which speaker you'd like to address the question to as you formulate uh, the questions. Um, I am just checking to see if uh, the first speaker is actually in the room. Just bear with me, be patient. And if not, perhaps I can suggest then we go ahead and uh, we start with the, uh, one of the panelists um, who's in the, in the room without further delay, which would be our distinguished guest, Ms. Zuna Aziz, who is the principal coordinator of the Sustainable Development Goals Affairs from the Prime Minister's Office in the Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Ms. Aziz, the floor is yours if you want to start sharing your presentation. Uh, thank you, moderator and organizers for giving me this opportunity to share Bangladesh experiences. Respected chair, fellow panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you. Uh, Uh, first of all, I like to uh, you all to greetings of Mujibiyar. The government of Bangladesh has announced the commemoration of the 2021 as the Mujibiyar on the occasion of the centennial birth anniversary of the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. The dream of Bangabundu was to build a Shunar Bangla with the visionary leadership of his daughter, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have realized that dream and Bangladesh has become a dazzling delta. SDG Tracker. First of all, I would like to share one of the most innovative data-driven approaches for achieving SDGs through a web-based SDZ results management tool, well known as SDZ Tracker. Bangladesh has developed a monitoring and evaluation framework for SDZs and based on that, the data ecosystem has been developed. Presently, 25 ministries are providing data into the system and 150 indicators data are available. More than 200 government focal point officials have been trained on it. HDZ Tracker has been helping policymakers to develop national plan and policies. It has increased the efficiency of HDZ reporting too. 
SDG Tracker has also adopted national priority targets of localization of SDGs from Bangladesh perspective. Advanced um, data analytics and financial inclusion and student teacher ratio. We understand that a set of indicators are not enough to measure the SDGs progress in order to identify who are left behind and to ensure inclusiveness in all aspects. We have introduced some data analytics in the SDG tracker, like the teacher-student ratio to locate and draw necessary action plan where we have to take appropriate intervention. Bangladesh has made very, very impressive progress in expanding financial service across the country, even in the remote, rural, and hard to reach areas. More than 60 million people now use mobile financial services. Nowadays, the entire stipend for school children to their mothers and all other social safety net cash benefits are being paid in their accounts through mobile money transfer. Open government data portal. We have launched an open data portal and adopted a national open data policy. To implement SDGs, it is necessary to make institutions more accountable, effective, and inclusive in service delivery. We are working to break data silos and making data open for public goods. Presently, 173 data sets are available. Introduce national multidimensional poverty index to eradicate poverty in all dimensions. We have introduced a national multidimensional poverty index to end poverty in all its forms. We have seen that though we have made significant progress in electricity supply, family planning, in education, but the housing is still a major concern. The government has taken a special plan that not a single person in Bangladesh would remain homeless in the Mujibiyar. Demonstration of the Dengue Tracking Visual Analytics. Recently, we have introduced advanced predictive data-driven solutions to fight against mosquito-borne disease like Dengue. Data persons, experts are using different types of data like rainfall, humidity, mobility data from telecom companies to set the algorithm to make an early prediction of Dengue outbreak. It helps local government institutions to take necessary preventive measures to mitigate the risk. It also integrated with an automatic alert to stakeholders, setting responsibility of stakeholders and resource management mechanism. Measuring COVID-19 impact on employment through that dashboard. Bangladesh has established an integrated dashboard to measure the COVID-19 impacts in different sectors to make policy decisions timely. This dashboard was developed to identify economic sectors where attention requires to look at and take necessary actions. Health resource management in COVID-19 situation. We have seen countries have suffered a lot for the limitation of resources during the peak time of the global pandemic. To ensure demand-based resource distributions, this dashboard helps policymakers to take the right action at the right time. Digital financial aid to 5 million poor households and food assistance to all needy households. The government has provided food assistance and digital financial aid to 5 million households who are needy and classified as poor people. Citizens are reported by calling through a free helpline call service. Millions of phone calls have been received during these days. Some came from health, for health services, some are for food assistance, information, etc. Therefore, data-driven decisions help us to fight this pandemic collaboratively 
with private and public partnership. Measuring impact on education in COVID-19 situation, the closure of all educational institutions has resulted in a bigger impact in the education sector. To measure the impact, we have introduced same kind of dashboard for the educational education sector to take appropriate policy decisions. E-education and e-learning platform keeps education system functional. We kept our education ecosystem functional using digital platforms during COVID-19. We have introduced TV and online classes for kids. E-learning platforms have been performing well. For the last decade, with the vision of Digital Bangladesh, thousands of e-services have been introduced in the country. This journey of the digital transformation really proved itself that Digital Bangladesh is not a dream. It is rather a reality now. Forbes has enlisted our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina as one of the successful women leaders in fighting COVID-19. The Economist magazine has enlisted Bangladesh as the ninth strongest economy in the wake of the pandemic. We are hopeful to achieve SDGs in time with the guidance of our visionary leader, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much for your intervention. I think it's extremely important to remind all of us of the relevance of data as a powerful tool uh, to be able to advance in achievement of the SDGs, um, particularly open data can, can greatly help in that sense, especially in relation to the collaborations that you mentioned between private and public civil society and, and the public sector to jointly find the solutions to the problems we are dealing with. So thank you very much for having reminded us about that. Um, and I would like now to leave the floor to Sir Peter Brookman, who is the former Chief Scientific Advisor of the Government of New Zealand. Sir Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I want to focus on a higher level issue, the issue of trust. Gathering data is, not, is nothing new for governments, whether it was in the form of the Doomsday Book a thousand years ago, or now in establishing the tax take. But what is relatively new is what data is collected, how it's collected, and why it's collected. Different societies have different levels of trust in their government's use of data and information. In no small part, this is due to the very nature of the political state, whether it's democratic or authoritarian, and the perception of where power lies. The thought that information is power is real in the minds of citizens. Of course, we're now dealing with the age of increasing use of big data and algorithmic policy decisions, and so this discussion of trust takes on different dimensions. It's clear that data can help governments make better decisions, but there are also dual use considerations. Data and the associated infrastructure can also be used as a worrying means of control. So these discussions, have real implications for citizens. Think of the objections in many countries to even carrying an identity card. The concept of privacy is changing in the big data world we live in. Social media encourages us to share material we would not have done so two years ago, 20 years ago. And privacy itself is a concept for which there's large cultural variation and it's far from the only issue. Surveys and focus groups in many countries, including my own New Zealand, and a recent study from Imperial College, show that people are less trusting of a government having a, their data than a, than a company. This surprises many, but it's a very consistent finding and suggests a deep issue over social license for the government's use of data and perceptions of who can have use, access to some aspects of their data. People understand at some level, perhaps naively, the nature of their bargain with Amazon or Google. We allow these companies access to our data, which we know will be monetized by them in return for a service. But when personal data are collected by a government, what will it be used for? Certainly there's a tax and benefit system, 
that in general, do, people do not link their own receipt of services to their giving of data to the state. What, in, what instead are the concerns of people who worry about this? Their indiscretions are revealed, they're seeing as loss of their autonomy. Really, do they really believe that a go giving government their data will generally be returned in the form of better services? In some countries, even filling in a census form is fraught, fraught with non-compliance and resilience. New Zealand saw this when it developed the integrated data infrastructure, which links information about every citizen across broad sectors of government and was designed to help governments make better decisions about investments in the full range of social services, from education to health, to housing, to welfare, uh, etc. But it was implemented without adequate social license, which together with misstatements as to its purpose and the almost inevitable bureaucratic errors jeopardized public trust. As a result, it was unfortunately politicized, which further undermined trust, limited its scope and its value to the policymaker. From being best in class, its use has been compromised and the potential of the system to better dissect out what works and what does not work across the social services cannot yet meet its full potential. Yet given the limitations... Yet given the limitations in any country's budget, using citizen-level data to understand what works in what context, be it in health, education, social housing, welfare, justice, or so forth, can be of enormous value. Doing so, however, requires genuine partnership and trust between state and citizen. It seems to me this should not be a partisan political matter. Indeed, robust interpreted data creates space for more honest values-based debate. There's an opportunity we may yet squander to advance economic and social sustainability if we do not address these issues of trust but the policy community is yet to fully understand the issues that must be addressed. It's reasonable to assume that the implications of this type of situation now flow to COVID responses as the concerns and trust deficits have appeared to have inhibited the introduction, of, for example, of supplementary digital contact tracing in many countries. Other issues have emerged in these experiments in the use of data and social policy, such as the debate over starter sovereignty for indigenous people, which occurred in New Zealand. I think this was a proxy debate for deeper issues of disempowerment, labels, discrimination, and fear of misuse of data in ways that would reinforce those biases. What is clearly needed is trusted and independent oversight of government use of data. The issues are more than privacy, more than traditional ethics. Data can do a lot to improve the human conditions, but governments have been reluctant to understand that their own use of data needs to be subject to trusted and principled oversight, which in turn requires co-development with the citizens. Now I need to turn to COVID. Before we do so, we need to ask the fundamental question. What is data? Data is not knowledge. Data is the aggregate of what we can measure with all the flaws about its collection as we try to study phenomena and gain some sense of reality. That is, we turn data into knowledge by organizing it and finding meaning in it. Increasingly, a data are put into models of various forms. Those models try to describe systems, but those systems always have unknowns, and the models we use are inevitably designed on the assumptions and path-dependent structures that are built into how those systems might be conceptually modelled to describe reality. But the assumptions along the way may not be obvious. The interdependencies can be non-linear and can only be guessed at. But one thing, the data may be non-representative. We try to tend to try and model open systems as closed systems. All this cries out for the need for data to be married with expert interpretation and analysis before it's called evidence, let alone knowledge. And the policy and political community need to understand these issues. Too often, uninterpreted data 
are turned into dogmatic statements of certainty. We must remember that numbers and graphs can be remarkably rhetorical. But rhetoric is important, but we must be careful to understand the power of big data and models to be very rhetorical, but not good at communicating uncertainty for integrating knowledge beyond the data for dealing with biases. COVID highlights these issues. Epidemiological models are being extensively used. Graphs have become the major form of communication, but the quality and purpose of models and presentation have been very variable. Some are trying to force decisions, some are attempts to understand behavior, others recognize the diversity in behavior. Some are very simplistic and are based on very naive assumptions about human behavior. Yet little has been communicated about the uncertainty in these models, or indeed the assumptions or the algorithms used in creating these models. Transparency just doesn't exist. Indeed, uncertainties beyond the model and indeed beyond the data often remain unstated. In part, this is because factors of importance may be left out, as was the human response in many of the early models. Data sets can often be biased, as we all know. Remarkably precise claims have been made for predictions from some of, by some of these models, which have then been taken up in the counterfactual with great dogmatism by politicians. Of course, the models have been critically useful in deciding what to do, but less hubris and more reflection is needed. We're early in this journey with big data, and as a society, we both appear both enthused by the hype associated with it, but also rightly concerned. Let us think through the limits of it and be de more demanding of understanding the issues any big data claim brings, particularly in the social sector, and what kind of linkage to expert interpretation and to oversight is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Sir Gruppmann, for having reminded us on the importance uh, related to the potential value of using data, but also the risks associated with that when it comes to uh, public trust. Um, just mentioned a number of concerns, but uh, the, the, the fear or the new um, aspects and dimensions of privacy or the fear, public fear of uh, data and related infrastructure being used as means of control are just a couple of them. So you very clearly made us realize the importance of uh, the implications for policy making when it comes to thinking about the use of data to uh, deal with emergencies or better policies, uh, not only focusing on the value for trust, but also the risks associated with public trust if we don't handle those issues properly. And um, I think this is a perfect uh, um, uh, bridge to give the floor to the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, Mr. Jeff Schlagenhoff, who will be sharing with us some reflections on how the OECD countries have been uh, dealing with using data to improve policies. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Deputy Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara, so much. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, we had a little, anyway. little difficulty on our end, um, probably due to my technical incompetence, but I, I think we've got it solved, at least here. Um, Wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be with you for the opening session of the 2020 Data for Policy Conference. And I'd like to extend my congratulations to the organizing committee for delivering a packed and interesting agenda on this vital topic, despite the prevailing challenges in 2020. This has, of course, been a year dominated by COVID-19. But even before its arrival, the role of the state has been under ever greater scrutiny in responding to the challenges of the 21st century, such as how do we address structural inequality? How do we transition to low carbon economies? And importantly, how do we restore trust in public institutions? And meeting the raised expectations of increasingly digitalized economies and societies. The pandemic has caused a domino effect of multiple challenges on an unprecedented scale. This isn't just a health crisis, but a multifaceted shock felt across society. 
from our perspective as individuals and citizens, uh, our concepts of normal have been completely upended, not just for days, but for weeks and months. Personally, the fact that I couldn't be back in the US in Buffalo, New York to watch the opening day of the NFL football season <laughs> was a really striking example of how unnormal things happen to be. On the other side of those experiences, sit our governments obliged to quickly, boldly develop and roll out policy responses and fiscal stimulus. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Give the background noise there for a second, it'll go away. Um, to face such complexity in ways that work for all requires those responsible for designing policies and services to join up their approaches and successfully collaborate within and across policy areas between different levels of government and alongside a broad coalition of private sector and civil society actors. This autumn, the OECD will launch the Digital Government Policy Framework and the very first pilot version of the Digital Government Index. Our analysis has shown that as societies have reacted to the impact of COVID-19, the level of digital government maturity has shaped the extent to which governments have been resilient, responsive, and agile in the face of complex and interrelated needs. The ability to be flexible and dynamic in an emergency reflects sustained investment and political commitment for building long-term foundations that allow for taking quick, trusted, most importantly, effective action. For example, in Denmark, a strategic commitment from both the public and private sector resulted in near universal adoption of digital integrity, simplifying the overnight shift to digital only public services. In the United Kingdom, the government as a platform approaching platform approach underpinning the gov.uk service toolkit helped maintain quality standards in launching over 100 new COVID-related services, responding at pace to the needs of the most vulnerable in the society. In Estonia, the interoperability of data and data digital integrity with the reuse of open source code from other governments allowed the swift introduction of a privacy preserving approach to contract tracing. In Korea, legal and regulatory environment governing data access made it possible to develop a suite of tools to respond to the outbreak while preserving citizen trust. The OECD has been tracking the breadth of these efforts in many ways. Across the organization, we've developed over 130 different policy responses in the COVID-19 hub. Our Observatory of Public Sector Innovation has tracked nearly 450 innovative responses to the COVID-19. The Digital Government Unit's collaboration with New York University has identified 85 examples of the use of open government data. That in itself is a lot of information to process, but our political, social, and economic research is dwarfed by the output of the world's study of the disease itself. A recent snapshot suggested that there are over 200,000 scholarly, scholarly articles with relevance to COVID-19. Whether as academics or as public policymakers, we're often overwhelmed with data. I know this from my own personal experience, but this isn't new. Whatever imperfect metaphor we might use, the narrative around data in the last few years has recognized just how much the world is producing and that if it could only be wrestled under control, that its application could be a catalyst for public value in helping to govern better. Equally well rehearsed are the same challenges that have hampered efforts to tackle the pandemic. The quality of data being the difference between life and death. Data interoperability of systems and between sectors or across borders being the exception rather than the rule. A lack of skills and capability 
to make the promise of a digital first, data-driven future a reality. In an ongoing trust deficit, especially in the public use, public sector use of data. A crucial piece of the puzzle in the digital government maturity of a given country is their governance and use of data. The digital government policy framework refers to this as the data-driven public sector and emphasizes three important areas. Number one, how governments are governing data and creating the enabling conditions to benefit fully. Countries need to develop a cross-government approach to data government, governance that covers leadership, strategic vision, coherent implementation, rules and guidelines, data infrastructure, and data architecture. The second is its use to unlock public value, whether through anticipation and planning, ongoing delivery, or retrospective evaluation and monitoring. And the third is concerned with the ethical, empowering, transparent, and secure handling of that data. In these ways, government's approach to data can positively contribute to safeguarding and restoring public trust, ensuring confidence in the way that governments handle data uh, at rest, as well as how data is put to use in ways that demonstrate government can serve and react effectively and equitably to meet the needs of the public. The intersection of data and policy is an urgent and critical challenge to governments, public servants, civil society actors, and private sector partners. And I will say that in, in this regard, I know that when I worked in the United States at the Office of Management and Budget, this was a critical focus in the United States of how we could make better use of data but do it in a way that maintain the confidence of the pub public in collecting and utilizing that data. And I think that's something shared across all countries. In the case of research about the disease, the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset Challenge, CORD-19, is hoping to bring order to the chaos of the 200,000 pieces of research. As a partnership between technologists academics, and government. It reflects a multidisciplinary approach that must be our default, working together to solve otherwise intractable problems. Events like Data for Policy reflect this valuable diversity and breadth of experience in bridging our organizational, sectoral, and national boundaries. In the face of 21st century policy challenges, sharing experience of what works, what doesn't, and crucially, why that might be critical in the effort to build back better with better policies for better lives. Uh, I wish you a successful rest of the meeting. Again, I apologize uh, to my colleagues at the OECD and those around the rest of the world uh, for being late in signing on. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join. This is absolutely a very, very critical topic of how we move forward and restoring, maintaining trust in government from citizens throughout the world is absolutely essential at this time. Thanks. Thank you very much, DSG Schlagenhauf, not only for sharing your experience from the OECD perspective, but also um, based on your previous head experience in the US government. And I think that you touched upon some of the key points that were brought up by the previous speakers as well, which have to see on the relevance of data to foster trust, resilience, but also to um, enable the collaboration among actors, which is needed to create public value. And I think that's perfect uh, to give the floor to our last um, but not least speaker, who is Ms. Janine Voss, who is the head of the SDG Accelerator at GSMA, which has the purpose to fast track mobile innovation and drive transformational industry leadership um, to help achieve the sustainable development goals. Janine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak as part of this very distinguished uh, set of uh, panel. Um, so, you know, as everyone is experiencing, the COVID-19 pandemic is really having a tremendous impact 
on people around the world, on public health, on the way we live, on the way we work, on the way we learn. And so from the outset of the pandemic, the mobile industry has stepped up to help people, help businesses, help governments and vulnerable communities, um, not just by ensuring connectivity. Uh, you know, you can imagine the surge in network traffic that the operators had to support and investment in added capacity they've made, but also to help governments disseminate critical health and emergency information, uh, offering communications and telemedicine solutions to hospitals, providing tools to support homeworking or content for remote learning, or helping people in financial hardship uh, by providing flexible payment options or lifting broadband caps. Uh, there's many more examples. But for this presentation, I will speak particularly about one such area that's really relevant to the Tate for Policy event, which is namely leveraging AI and mobile big data analytics for COVID-19. So moving to the next slide. The um, GSMA launched the AI for Impact initiative in 2017 really with the aim to scale up mobile big data analytics and AI for the SDGs. So we set up an advisory panel of UN agencies and partners, uh, such as uh, the WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, and a task force of 21 mobile operators from around the world, in order to together establish a common framework, a common approach for successfully implementing mobile big data projects, looking at the technical, the commercial, the ecosystem needs, but critically also really the privacy and ethical requirements to deliver sustainable, scalable products and services. And then at the local level, we then work in countries or cities with operators, governments and partners to implement projects, drive cross-sector collaboration and really unlock market opportunities. And maybe to underline with what we mean with mobile big data analytics and AI, uh, this is where operators are leveraging aggregated, non-identifiable mobile network data, then combining this with other third-party data sets, applying advanced analytics and packaging this into meaningful tools that can aid governments, agencies in evaluation, in planning and decision-making. So for example, by combining mobility patterns, uh, understanding the volumes of people at certain locations, combining that with weather data, with infrastructure maps, with disease incidents or hospital locations, you could develop decision support systems for emergency services to quickly deploy rescue teams to the right location in the case of an earthquake or flood or dashboards that predict air pollution levels so that cities can take preventative steps or insights to help decide where to deploy healthcare infrastructure in a way that ensures the maximum access to critical care by the population. And so from the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the GSMA AI for Impact team has been working with our task force and advisory panel to share knowledge, best practices, and really promote privacy policies to help operators maximize their contributions at the time and to really drive the adoption of big data analytics for COVID-19. And in addition, with great thanks to funding by the FCDO, we're also running a dedicated project then to replicate that and take those learnings, take those, take those best practices and support governments, operators and partners in low middle income countries to also deploy these solutions and dashboards. So moving to the next slide, please. Uh, so why is mobile big data analytics so valuable in the COVID-19 response? Um, with mobile insights, you can provide information on where people are moving or which communities might be at most vulnerable or at most at risk. And so operators have provided products and services to governments. You can think here about dashboards, tools, reports, um, really providing analytical insights to aid their COVID-19 response. Um, for example, to aid the evaluation of lockdown strategies uh, and, and measures. Uh, as an example, in France, Orange worked with INSERM, which is the French public research agency for human health. They worked together already very early on to help prepare and evaluate lockdown measures. And what they found is that the, uh, the lockdowns were very effective in reducing journeys. There was a 65% reduction. 
particularly it was effective to reduce work and long recreational trips, but it also showed some unexpected results. For example, 20% of people had already left Paris before the lockdown uh, took place. And so that really showed the importance of carefully thinking through public messaging, but also the importance of having that up-to-date information and really understanding where the population is, is moving to, to aid in the resource planning. Another example is around epidemiological modeling. Um, since January 2020, even before any cases were detected in Norway, Telenor has been working closely with the Norwegian government's COVID-19 task force to help them model the potential spread of the virus so that they could predict the number of hospitalizations, predict the number of intensive care patients so that the healthcare system could be better prepared and allocate resources where they were expecting they would be most needed. Or insights can also help aid in vulnerability assessments or supply chain management. So in Nigeria, MGN worked with the Nigerian Governors Forum to deliver a, really a comprehensive dashboard to support needs-based interventions by states. So based on a likely number of cases and exposure and other insights from MGN's network, uh, MGM was able to establish a number of vulnerable citizens who might require social support and also helped identify the number of test kits or test centers or medical practitioners that were needed by state so that the government could more efficiently deploy resources and aid across the country. So what we're doing at the GSMA is taking those examples and then capturing learnings, capturing recommendations and replicating that in low middle income countries with great thanks to FCDO funding. So for example, in the DRC, GSMA is, has established a cross-sector collaboration with government operating partners to create dashboards to help their COVID-19 task force evaluate the effectiveness of lockdown measures and monitor health infrastructure capacity in Kinshasa. So over the course of the last six months, we've seen more and more examples around the world of operators working with governments in this way and deploying different products and services from Ecuador to Ghana, from Italy to South Korea. But nevertheless, we're still a while away from truly widespread adoption of mobile big data analytics, and particularly across a wide range of use cases. So we're sitting on this tremendous potential, <laughs> uh, not just currently, but also for the future. So think about future crises, being prepared for another a pandemic, but also think about other use cases such as uh, climate change, responding to natural disasters or infrastructure planning. So there's a vast amount of opportunities there. So what from our side is key for success. So of course, first and foremost, safeguarding privacy and ethics is really paramount. Over the last years, we've published privacy and ethical considerations for mobile big data analytics and AI, thinking about transparency and accountability, inclusiveness, fairness, security and safety. And mobile operators also during the COVID-19 crisis are really committed to protecting the privacy of individuals and will be uh, always operating in accordance with privacy laws. Uh, a second point on the line is that um, mobile big data analytics and products do require innovation and investments. So imagine that operators are capturing billions of data points from the operation of a vast, complex, dynamic mobile network, continued investment and innovation in processing that data, applying advanced analytics, packaging this data, creating tools and products that are useful and meaningful to governments. That takes time and investment, that requires resources, particularly if services are to be delivered on an ongoing basis and therefore require automated solutions. So really this requires careful thought around sustainability in ongoing uh, business models. So just to wrap up, um, you know, it is possible to develop these products and services whilst protecting people's privacy and following ethical approaches through privacy by design. Also very important to ensure that products, products these solutions are bound to a specific purpose and a specific time frame. But what is needed to unlock this further? So we need to continue to raise awareness of this opportunity, of the value, the impact, how to create trusted solutions, continue to share our know-how, continue to share best practices, 
and continue to capture and show the evidence of the cost versus the benefits so these solutions can help save life they can help enhance efficient allocation of government resources they can speed up response times um, but that needs to be uh, really well understood so we're trying to play our part through the ai for impact initiative we publish all our case studies and, and learnings on our ai for impact toolkit online but in addition, we need, you know, beyond driving this demand and awareness is also continue thinking through how can we drive the investment in the systems, the skills, the talent by governments around the world to really enable them to formulate the needs to capture value out of these tools and to leverage them to their potential. And um, how can we drive more procurement investment and innovations? How can this space be more incentivized? So we've seen great examples of thought leading governments around the world for adopting these products and services, um, but we're hoping to drive more awareness and, and adoption there. So really the aim is to say that where we want to be in say a number of years time is to be better prepared, to have these solutions readily in place, for them to be commonplace, to aid governments, business and citizens um, for the next uh, emergency and pressing challenges in the world. So thank you very much uh, for, for your time and allowing me to speak on this subject. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Janine. First of all, for providing um, a number of good examples showing how the use of data can actually help design innovative services and responses. We'll have a special session on these mm -hmm. in a couple of days in the conference. And I think it's extremely important to underline one of the key points you made that we need to make sure that the use of data responds to a specific need um, is linked to a specific time frame, and this is extremely relevant to gain or regain or maintain some of the trust that Peter was also talking about. And thanks also to underline another point, which is the importance of public communication and raising awareness about these opportunities. I think those two points are a very nice uh, complement to the reflections shared by the previous uh, speakers. Um, and I would like now to open the floor for questions. Uh, luckily, we have about uh, 10 minutes before we uh, need to wrap up this plenary, which gives some time for questions from the public. So please um, uh, write your question um, in the chat, um, clear, brief, and indicating to who, which speaker you would like to address it. Or if you have problems doing it in the, in the chat, you can raise your hand and I will ask Emily um, and Ben to help me out in uh, checking the names of the people who would like to speak. Thank you. Don't be shy. This is the ice-breaking uh, panel and, and session of the conference. So I have a question for Peter. The question is, any specific practice of open data in New Zealand? Well, I think successive governments have been promoting an open data policy. The issue is not the policy. The issue is actually the infrastructure needed for it. The issues are around curation, uh, 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 and we found that in general it takes a lot of resources within government agencies to transmit to, to change their attitudes to actually promote open data. We do have some areas where the, da the Department of Statistics, the National Statistics Agency, promote has an enormous number of public data sets. They're very, very responsive to inquiry. And they, they will do, particularly for the academic community, quite a lot uh, of, of free support. I mentioned the integrated data infrastructure, uh, which brings together the social sector data with appropriate controls over access and levels of access. Uh, all the universities have terminal access uh, for licensed academic study using the database. So I think in general, New Zealand is committed to it. As I said, I don't think that's the issue in New Zealand. I think the issues are twofold. The issues are within the agencies themselves of opening up data sets that may not be clean enough and they're embarrassed over their state. And the second is the issues of, uh, of the social license for the use of the data which governments have. Thank you, Peter. 
I have a question for Janine. The question is, what is the role of data literacy to support take up of mobile solutions? And what are the risks in terms of digital divide, in your view? Yeah, that's a really important point. And um, I think also one that I would like to underline uh, that that's not just on the supply side. So what's really important is to drive the knowledge, the skills, the systems, the talent across governments, across partners, across suppliers of data um, to really create solutions that are meaningful, where it's well understood end to end also how to create a trusted solution, how to manage that data. There are so many aspects that need to be considered when deploying these solutions in a way that is meaningful, that is also safe. Um, and so we see a tremendous need for increased education and capacity building uh, and driving more talent and skills uh, across, across the public and private sector. We're trying to play a role in that. The GSMA is offering capacity building um, courses for governments around the world. Uh, we have courses specifically on AI and big data, also on privacy. Um, and also we have a collaboration with some of the universities to also bring more education and, and, and knowledge from the, from, from the early students on. So this, this is a very important area to continue driving uh, over the coming years. Thank you, Janine. And actually, I have another question for you. Um, the question is, by nature, governments tend to be very secretive. So how do we can, uh, sorry, how can we flatten COVID-19 when uh, countries are not willing to open uh, data on COVID-19? Um, well, I think, well, it depends maybe on a country to country basis. Um, I think a lot of governments are doing a lot to keep the, the general public informed um, and to also publish information on the state of the number of cases, for example. Um, and there is this double, double thing also from a mobile operator perspective, of course, we want to make sure that the information is shared, respects and respects people's privacy. Um, but we have, uh, for example, Telia in, in, in the Nordic countries, they have made a decision to publish highlights of their uh, population movement studies or insights, their dashboards on their website so that it is available for people to, to see. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, it's really important for that, you know, transparency to be realized. Um, and also that's a role for governments, of course. Um, and, and, but the same, the, the mobile industry can also play a role subject to that being done in a, in a way that really guarantees people uh, privacy uh, and security. Thank you very much. And I have a question for uh, Zuena, which is, um, what has been the significant enabler to help opening up data in Bangladesh? Zuena, I'm not sure you can uh, hear us. And I think, I think that um, the DSG Schlagenhauf had to leave. So I'm not sure if there's any hand that went up for asking any question. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Aziz. Yeah. Would you like Thank me to you. repeat the question? Yes, please. Yes. So the question for you is, um, what has been the significant enabler supporting the opening up of data in Bangladesh? Actually, uh, Bangladesh uh, has formulated policies, a uh, lot of poli poli different policies for the opening the data uh, among different sectors, different ministries and divisions. Uh, it, it is the main things and also a lot of um, uh, programs and projects for the di um, different um, organizations because they actually um, in Bangladesh, uh, we are mainly depends on the administrative data. So nowadays government is trying to um, uh, make the data bank more uh, resourceful that they uh, take some uh, special uh, uh, projects for the census and also for the research, these things. And 
also actually uh, there is uh, no doubt about it that the open, uh, open data open is a must for the uh, each uh, any developing countries or developed countries because otherwise we will not um, uh, implement or uh, we will not um, the um, the uh, real real things or the the uh, real um, need based uh, development or need based activities uh, that is why actually government is uh, government policies is data open actually evidence based policy making for the evidence based policy making the data is uh, necessary and for uh, that is why government is open the data thank you very much zena any other question from the floor if not i am going to ask a final question I'm going to ask a final question to all the panelists before we wrap up and close this open uh, plenary session. And um, you are clearly, uh, from different perspectives, um, practitioners with a lot of experience. Um, you've been working towards the use of data to improve services and results. Uh, you have been uh, studying it, you have assessing it, you've been advising about that. So my key question for you is if there was one piece of advice, one single piece of advice, as we try not to waste time um, in the current context, um, which is something that governments uh, and key actors working with government should prioritize as of tomorrow morning or better this evening, what would be that one piece of advice? And I'll start with you, Janine. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's a good question. I think one piece of advice, um, I think the starting point is uh, speak basically speak to the experts that can provide these services and, and and see what insights can be available and be very open about the challenges and the needs that you have in terms of the data requirements. So from the from where I'm sitting, of course, from the supply side, from the mobile operator side, to really understand very clearly what are the big decision points what are the piece big pieces of insight that a government needs to work through this crisis will then help the suppliers of analytical products and services to really tailor to that and and come with the best solutions they can find and, and to drive towards that so that would be um, uh, my call to action in a way thank you peter the one piece of advice on something to prioritize? I, th I think it comes back to the issue of giving the government, the public confidence that their data is being used properly and fairly. And I think that we've seen in the, the debate going on over contact tracing and whether you can use mobile phones or other Bluetooth devices in contact tracing, that if you haven't already got independent, trusted oversight over those things, the public, the, but the public and the politicians are scared to move. And, and so I think it comes back to realizing that while the COVID's the crisis, the issue is broad across the whole of government. Thank you. Um, Ms. Aziz, if you're still with us and you would like to provide your piece of advice on what should be the main priority for any government as yes. of this morning? Yes. Thank you. Actually, I think that first of all, the political commitment. This is first. And secondly, resource channelized. And third, capacity building. And uh, uh, not the um, last, but the vision. 2041. Actually, these things is uh, behind the Bangladesh success or Bangladesh uh, transformation to the digital country. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank all of you because not only you made my work 
as chair of this session easy, um, but also because that was easy because you shared extremely uh, key uh, reflections on, I think, one point, which is a, a common element in all your interventions, which is also the relevance to connect the different policy actions that oftentimes are taken um, as separating governments around data, around digital, around open data, around trust, around transparency, around the use of AI, for instance. Whereas I think what came out extremely clearly from your presentations is that not only, obviously, the use of data is a great potential to achieve major policy goals to deliver better services, but there are many implications we need to take into consideration. And only if we connect all those policy efforts, I think we can eventually get to our citizens and economies the value that they expect out of the use of uh, data. So I really thank all of you for having uh, um, accepted to join this opening plenary. And I give it back uh, to the organizers um, of the conference, uh, Emily, um, to close the session. Thank you very much.